Hello and welcome one and all to the Lunchtime Discovery Series. It's great to be with you all this Wednesday afternoon for another edition of the lecture series called Lunchtime Discovery. I'm your host, Chris Smith. I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences in downtown Raleigh, and we are the, the broadcast service for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Now, this program is coordinated and organized by the folks within the Department of Environmental Quality in the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. Many thanks to them for their dedicated work to bring you this series every single week and to the team at the museum who makes it happen all the time for you here. Um, like I said, it's good to be with you. As always, we've got another great program for you. One I think that you're gonna enjoy. Uh, all of us like you know, nature people out here who like the plants and the animals and I don't know, I like to think that the lunchtime discovery audience is a group of people who care about the environment and care about nature and care about wildlife. And so based on at least the title of today's program, Discarded Roadside Bottles, I think we're going to get some valuable information from today's guest. Now, uh, as we go through the program, if you feel like there's more valuable information that you just need to know, you can ask questions. It's a great thing about this program. You don't just have to sit there and listen. You can actually type up your questions into the chat on YouTube. You can post them in the comments thread. If you're watching on Facebook, you can even tweet them with the hashtag lunchtime discovery, and they will all make their way to me where I can help moderate and facilitate our audience Q&A segment. But that will come at the end of the presentation. But it's helpful for me if you type those questions up as we go, as they pop into your brain. That way they're all queued up for the Q&A. So I know you've got things you want to know, folks. Type them up and let me know. But we should jump into it. Let me introduce today's guest. Today we'll be hearing from Patrick Brannon. He's the Outreach Education Specialist and Naturalist at Highlands Biological Station with Western Carolina University. And Patrick joins me now. Hi there. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, like you said, my name is Patrick Brannon. I work at the Highlands Biological Station, which is a satellite campus of Western Carolina University. Um, if you don't know where that is, which most people don't, um, Western Carolina University is in Jackson County, which is um, about an hour and a half west of Asheville. And we're another hour beyond that in Macon County in Highlands, North Carolina. Um, what the Highlands Biological Station is, is we've been around since 1927, um, and we are a research facility. Of course, scientists come from all over the United States, and in some cases the world, to study the plants and animals of our southern Appalachian Mountains. Um, one thing that the station is kind of world famous for is salamander research, and you can see that incorporated in our love as I share my PowerPoint. There it is. Um, but we have uh, classes going on all the time. Like right now, we have summer courses going on. So we have classes on fungus and birds and ferns and mosses and all the things that make our Southern Appalachian Mountains um, special and a lot of unique organisms that are found here and in high diversity. Um, the thing that I study, I do study salamanders, but also study shrews and um, I, I say recent, it's not that recent really, but what I've been doing is looking at how bottles that people throw out on the sides of the roads um, kill lots of shrews and other small mammals. And some of the applications of the data you can collect from these bottles. So let's get going here. So the Southern Appalachian Mountains is the center for shrew and salamander diversity in North America. Um, shrews are found throughout North Carolina, but they reach their highest diversities in the mountain region. We have as many as eight species of shrews, which is a lot for a vertebrate group. Um, but a lot of people want to know well, what is a shrew? It, you know, it, they say, well, it's some kind of small mammal, but what is it exactly? Well, let's begin by talking about what it isn't. It is not a rodent. A lot of people think it's some kind of mouse, but it's not. Um, rodents are things like mice and voles. Voles are kind of like short-tailed mice with furry ears. Their teeth are a little different. We'll talk more about that. Um, things like chipmunks, squirrels, groundhogs, beavers are all rodents. And rodents are characterized by having these long incisor teeth that are ever-growing to compensate for tooth wear as they gnaw on things like seeds and nuts. And um, in the case of beavers, trees. 
then they have this gap here with no teeth, and then these flat molars in the back for grinding up plant material. So rodents are primarily herbivorous. Um, in the case of a mouse and a vole, you can tell them apart, but we're gonna be talking more about how to identify skulls from um, these bottles that you find. Um, you can tell it's a rodent because it'll have those buck teeth, those long incisors. Um, you can't necessarily get it to species, but you can tell whether it's a mouse or a vole by their molars. So mice have these kind of round peg molars, much like our teeth. It's kind of individual socketed molars. But voles, which are the kind of short-tailed mice things, um, have these molars that are like lightning bolts. They're kind of fused as one big tooth. Trues, however, are insectivores. They're related to moles. They do not have those teeth like that. So shrews um, and, and moles have sharp teeth for shredding up the exoskeletons of insects. And we'll, I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. Um, most people are familiar with moles. Moles are subterranean. So they have these enlarged front feet and long claws for tunneling underground. And then they have short fur so they can glide easily through their tunnels without getting stuck. They're not blind or deaf, but they do have very reduced eyes and ears, again, because you don't need them underground. Well, shrews are kind of like a mole, but they don't have those front feet. Those enlarged front feet. So they don't tunnel underground. Instead, they just kind of root around in the leaf litter layer on the forest floor. But otherwise, they're very similar to moles. So both moles and shrews, like we said, are insectivores. So instead of having buck teeth for gnawing on seeds, they have all these sharp pointy teeth for ripping up these hard exoskeletons of beetles and, and other insects and other invertebrate prey. In the case of shrews, they have these hooked elongated incisors and they use them like forceps for picking up tiny insects. So anyway, very different skulls and different group of, of mammals. So in the mountains, um, there's a handful of shrews that are very common. The most common one is the northern short-tailed shrew, Blarina brevicata. Uh, it's about the size of a mouse. And if you have a cat, undoubtedly, they've probably killed one of these once upon a time. Um, but you can tell it's not a mouse because it doesn't have big ears and eyes. It has that long pointy snout full of all those sharp teeth and very fine short fur. So the northern short-tailed shrew is actually a venomous mammal. There's not very, very many venomous mammals in the world, but um, the genus Blarina is. Now it's not venomous like a rattlesnake or something like that. It has a mild venom in its saliva that it uses to paralyze its invertebrate prey. But the advantage of paralyzing it versus killing it is that it can keep it alive. These things um, have very fast metabolism. So they're constantly foraging for food. Um, but if they find a lot of insects that they can't eat right there on the spot, they don't want them to go away. And they also don't want to kill them and have them rot. So instead they can stun them, carry them back to their nest and save them for later. So anyway, that one is super common. And this is the one you'll find far beyond any others in bottles, at least in the mountain region. Then we have genus Sorex, which is the long-tailed shrew. Um, the most common of these and the largest of these is the smoky shrew, or it's fumius, fumius, like smoke, grayish fur. Um, but this is just for scale. This is, again, this is a large sorex. Um, you can see it on a leaf here. So these are tiny little shrews, are tiny, tiny little creatures. Anyway, this one is very common. Then they get progressively smaller. So next we have the mask shrew. And I'm not really sure why it's called the mask shrew because it doesn't have a mask like a raccoon or something. But the scientific name Sorex cinereus means reddish brown. So it has this reddish brown like cinnamon fur um, and it's smaller than the other one. And then we have the pygmy shrew, Sorex hoyi, which is the smallest mammal in North America. And it's the second smallest mammal in the entire world. The bumblebee bat is smaller than this. But in North America, this is the smallest. This is its skull compared to the diameter of a dime. So it's a tiny, tiny little, little creature. And it's Lots of little teeny tiny insects. And these animals are pretty abundant in our mountain forest. They're just very secretive and small, and they hide amongst the leaf litter layer. But why does the Southern Appalachian in particular have such a high diversity of shrew species? 
Well, the answer to this applies to lots of organisms in the mountain region, not just shrews. Um, a lot of it has to do with the topography of the region, especially where I am in highlands. We're, we're right here in the corner of Georgia and South Carolina, and we're right on the edge of the Blue Ridge Escarpment, which means you don't have to drive very far to drop very quickly in elevation. About a 30 minute drive down towards Walhalla, which is near Clemson, South Carolina, um, you can drop 3000 feet in elevation and, and just a 30 minute drive. So it's a very abrupt change in elevation. And consequently, you have kind of a, in that zone, you have an overlap of high elevation Northern species and low elevation Southern species, all kind of converging in that, in that latitude. So you get kind of a double dose of uh, species. But within that latitude, um, they can also kind of segregate by elevation. So at the mountain tops, like up here where I'm in Highlands, North Carolina, uh, we have the mass shrew. But if you go down into the lower elevation valleys, you might get the southeastern shrew, which is a more southern species. Then within that zone, they also segregate by habitat type. Um, so shrews, for the most part, um, because of their high water turnover rates, prefer wet, more mesic habitats. So you find a lot of these in um, rich cove forests on north facing slopes, much like you would salamanders or rhododendron or other things like that that are moisture loving. Um, and then you have others like short tail shrews that are habitat generalists. They can be found in all sorts of habitat types. So in the mountain region, these are, again, the, the uh, species assemblages that you find the most. So at high elevation, you get these northern species, the pygmy shrew, mass shrew, smoky shrew, and northern short tail shrew in, in increasing size. I don't have the Lorraine in this picture here, but you have three or four of different sizes. Their species counterparts at lower elevation or southern latitudes. So the pygmy shrew is replaced by the least shrew, which is a different genus still. It's genus Cryptotus parva. Um, the mass shrew is replaced by the southeastern shrew. The smoky shrew doesn't really have a species counterpart at lower elevations. And then the northern short tail shrew is replaced by the southern short tail shrew. So that's farther south and farther east. Occasionally, you also get two rare species which contribute to species diversity. The rock shrew, Sorex dispar, and the water shrew, Sorex palustris. The rock shrew is a rare species. Um, it's the same size as the smoky shrew, which may contribute to its um, rarity because it's a species competitor, same body size. Um, it's found more in boulder fields, which is why, which is why they call it the rock shrew. And then the water shrew um, has little fringes on its toes and actually dives down in the water in creeks and things and eats a whole lot of aquatic insects. But these um, size differences here um, is one way that they can occur together. Uh, much like salamanders in a stream, there's kind of a pattern to their microhabitat use that is associated with body size. So um, they occur together, but they occupy, occupy slightly different microhabitats and eat slightly different prey items or different size prey items. And that's why um, you have so many species and so many shrews all coexisting together. Okay, but as I mentioned, my uh, more recent research is looking at bottles on the size of the roads and how they can actually capture and kill lots of shrews and other small mammals such as mice. The way it works is these shrews will be rooting around in the leaves and they primarily use their sense of smell. So they're smelling for insect prey and they encounter a bottle, especially one that's buried in the leaves. And they think that that opening is a tunnel or they might just go in there for exploratory purposes or looking for food or water. And they get in there and they can't get back out, especially if the bottle is on a slope, which we have a lot of in the mountains. So if the bottle's pointing uphill like this, it's like a miniature pitfall trap. These small animals enter the bottle, they fall down in there, and then it's too slippery for them to crawl back out. Or if the bottle has collected rainwater, then they'll drown in these bottles too. So the purpose of, of our study was, was twofold. One is just using the bottles as a survey technique. We don't need to set lots of Sherman traps or pitfall traps because the bottles serve as traps. So we just need to go look for bones. And so at each site, we can get a data point and map the geographic distributions of all these different shrew species, especially as we go up and down the mountain from high to low elevation. And we can also use it 
to uh, compare habitat associations between these species. The second part of our study was to examine the mortality rates, the, the impacts of these, litter, these uh, bottles, the litter, on small mammal populations. So calculating the capture rates and potential conservation implications, especially for some of the rarer species. Give me one moment, it's raining, I need to shut my window. A big storm just come up. All right, so um, several years ago, I had some students and we had 220 sites across multiple counties in North Carolina, Georgia, and South Carolina. And it was a little bit biased because we didn't just randomly go along roads. We, here in the mountains in particular, there's lots of pull-offs on the sides of these roads. Um, and that's where bottles and other trash tend to accumulate because people pull over there and drink their bottle of soda or whatever and throw it out the window. Um, but at each of these pull-out areas, we would walk approximately 100 meters of road and we would go into the forest as far as we could continue to find bottles. So in some cases where there was a very steep ravine, we would go way off the road down into the woods because the bottles roll all the way down there. Um, we would kind of just walk around and shuffle our feet and uncover bottles. Um, and we would look inside. And if it appeared like there was something inside, then we would take the bottles out of the woods up to the vehicle and then we, we would examine them for, for bones and other materials in there. Um, we didn't do a litter pickup. That would be impossible. There's just so much litter, but we would remove the ones that we thought had something in there. We also looked at aluminum cans um, and other researchers have found bones in aluminum cans, but we did not. So we kind of excluded that from our analyses, but um, bottles included things like beer bottles, soda bottles, wine bottles, but also other containers with a narrow mouth, like a milk jug, um, antifreeze containers, in anything like that that could potentially capture um, small mammals. We would also classify the habitat type by moisture content. So it went from what we call a class one, which was like a dry pine community down to lower elevations, um, all the way to class five, which are these uh, cove hardwood mountain stream rhododendron thicket type habitat. And this is what we find. So um, if you're lucky, it's kind of like an owl pellet in a bottle. It's a nice dry ball of fur and bones, which you can then either break the bottle or, or carefully extract the forceps to examine. Um, unfortunately, most of the time it's very gross, it's nasty. It's not just a dry thing. It's a ball of stinky, nasty slime that you have to glop out. <laughs> um, so it takes a kind of a strong stomach in some cases to, to do this kind of work. But anyway, you take the bones and you carefully clean them off. You have to be careful though, because um, these things in many cases have been soaking in this for who knows how long. And so they're very soft. And if you clean them too rough, they can fall apart or if they have a skull, they can, their teeth can fall out and teeth are gonna be very important for identifying these species. Um, but, but anyway, we clean them as best we can. And this is what we find. And believe it or not, this particular picture, this is all from a single bottle. There's 22 skulls um, in three different species from one bottle, it was a large like wine bottle, but regardless. So here we have, this is Blarina, the Northern Shorttail Shrew. This is some sort of rodent here. And then we have smoky shrews here. So once you've extracted the, the skeletal remains, then you have to try to identify the species. And for shrews, um, this can be quite challenging, especially because the main way you identify shrews is by their teeth. And as we showed you, some of them, their skulls are smaller than the diameter of a penny or a dime. So you have to use a stereo microscope and look at their teeth, or at least the sockets where the teeth used to be, and compare cranial features and these teeth. These main teeth here are called unicuspid teeth. Those are the ones you use the most. So here, um, these are two different, very similarly sized species. Um, for like Blarina, you can kind of tell that off the bat because it's much larger and kind of chunkier and wedged. Um, it's that one that's more mouse sized. These other ones, you have to look at more subtle differences. So these that are very similar sized, um, the mass shrew here has a longer, more narrow snout, where this one is more kind of an equilateral triangle. This one is more elongated. The brain case in this mass shrew is more inflated. It's more like a sphere, whereas in the other one, it's more deflated, kind of squished. 
Um, and then the main thing is looking at their teeth. So in the mass shrew here, it has five unicuspid teeth that are all roughly the same size. But in the southeastern shrew down here, the third and fifth teeth are significantly smaller than the rest. So that's the level of detail you have to go. After you've seen these 100 times, you can kind of just learn to recognize them. But initially, um, it takes a lot of practice. So here's um, some of our geographical data that we collected. So for northern short-tailed shrews, we found that they were not associated with any habitat type. They were found all over the place and at all elevations. So they were way up here in North Carolina, at the mountaintops, and then down in South Carolina, down in the valleys, and in very dry pine forest and in very wet um, rhododendron thicket type forest. So they're kind of ubiquitous in this region. Um, smoky shrews, which is genus Sorex on the other hand, um, was associated with high elevation, wet forests. We did find them down at lower elevations in here in Georgia, but that's along the Chattooga River. And the habitat, even though it's a lower elevation, the habitat type is very comparable to those found in northern high elevation forests. So we found a few little kind of disjunct populations down here. But for the most part, they're associated at high elevations and in wet forests. But then when you get to the mast and southeastern shrews, these are the ones that are the same size. So they're more in direct competition with each other. So they segregate themselves based on um, elevation and habitat type. So the mass shrew, Sorex cenarius, was found only in North Carolina at high elevation and in very wet forests. Whereas the southeastern shrew was found only at lower elevations and in very dry forests. So this is what we call contiguous allopatry. So during our study, we uh, examined over 10,000 bottles at those 220 sites. And again, bottles is kind of a broad term. Um, of those, if, if they have bottle caps on them, then it's still litter, but they can't capture a mammal. They're, they're not a, a, an actual trap. So those are eliminated. But unfortunately, well over half of the bottles that were out there did not have caps on them. So they serve as potential traps. And at these pull-off sites, we averaged 28 traps, not bottles, but traps, open bottles per site. So there's a lot of trash out there. And if you do the math, um, it averaged 382 open bottle traps per mile of road. So there's lots of trash um, in our mouths, open bottles that can capture mammals. And that equates to, um, during dura the duration of our study, nearly 2 million trap nights or 382,000 trap nights annually. A trap night, if you don't know, is an opportunity for an animal to be captured. So you can have one trap out for 100 nights, and that would be 100 trap nights, or 100 chances for an animal to, to get captured, or 100 traps for one night. It's the same number of potential entrapments. The good, good, if you can call it that, good news, is we did this for several years, and each year we would count how many bottles were at a particular site. And we did see that on average, it was only about one bottle per site each year gained, which means people aren't really continuing to litter. So that's, that's good, but that's still an increase. It's not a decrease. And all those bottles that had been there are still there. So even though the accumulation rate is slow, um, it's still an increase and it's continuing to capture uh, mammals year after year, year after year. Here's a breakdown of what we caught. Again, primarily shrews because they kind of forage by their sense of smell and just root around, but it still captures lots of rodents and even one mole we got. This is the only record of a mole ever captured from a bottle because they're usually too big, but we, we got one of them. Almost 700 animals during our study. Um, and the big number here though is the capture rate. It's nearly 12%, which is very high. Um, it's greater in the higher elevations where there's more shrews than at lower elevations or farther east, but nevertheless, the, the rate of entrapment is, is pretty high. But anyway, we've got mostly northern short-tailed shrews, um, probably because they're bigger and they can't um, escape as easily, or their bones are large enough that they don't um, decompose before we find them. Some of these small shrews, we find their jaw bones, um, but sometimes not anything else because they've just been scavenged by beetles or, or they've 
deteriorated before we'd been able to find them. We have no way of knowing how long they've been in the bottle unless it's still got fur on it. Um, they could have been there a day or they could have been there a year. We, have, we really don't know. Um, but lots of smoky shrews, a few of the other ones, lots of mice too, deer mice, white-footed mice, and so forth. So, so it's not just shrews, um, but primarily shrews that get captured in these, in these bottles. So we got a total of 12 different mammal species, um, but a few other herps too. So salamanders for the most part can escape, but we did find some dead ones in bottles and one snake, a little uh, ring neck or worm snake in a bottle too, but also lots of insects. So lots of beetles, millipedes and snails as well. Um, in the mountains here, there's a lot of, I don't know if they're endangered, but rare species of snails um, that are dying as a result of these bottles as well. Um, most of the sites, we found at least one thing. So it's, it's sad, but at the same time, it's very useful teaching a class. Um, we don't have to spend much time in the field. We can go to a site and within about 20 minutes, we found a bottle with something in it. So it's useful from a teaching perspective, but it's sad from a conservation perspective. And usually we find more than one at a site too, as long as it's been enough time has elapsed. Uh, about five of the bottles had a specimen, but usually when you find a skull in a bottle, you find more than one. And I don't think it's because the remains of one animal is attracting another. I think it's more an artifact of the position of the bottle. Um, it's just a good trap. So it's collecting several animals. And again, the most we got from one bottle was 22, representing three different species. Um, and so doing the math for, for all the duration of our study, the annual mortality rate is about 3%, which equates to 40 mammals killed per mile each year. So if you extrapolate that to all the roads around here that we didn't study, um, that there's lots of small mammals that are dying each year um, due to people's littering. This phenomenon is more prevalent in the mountains, but it occurs statewide. Um, but in the mountains, it's particularly bad because we have these steep slopes. And if you've ever gone back roads in our mountains, you'll see, unfortunately, that people use these ravines as illegal dump sites. They don't want to bother carrying their litter to the, uh, the trash to the landfill. They just dump it in the wood. So way down in these ravines, we find not just bags of garbage, but um, washing machines and sofas and you name it. Um, and when people litter here, they don't just stay on the shoulders of the roads. They roll way down into the mountain, I mean, down into the ravine and get buried by leaf litter and, and get hidden in the vegetation. And they're more likely to land in that kill position where the bottle is on a slope and the animals can fall in there or, or it can accumulate rainwater and they can't escape. So it's much worse in the, in the mountains. That may be part of the reason we didn't find so much down the mountain too is when we did find bottles, they tended to be more uh, horizontal, so the animals can more likely escape, and they weren't very far off the road like they are farther up the mountain, which means cleanup crews pick them up. So we have cleanup crews here in our mountains too, but they only get those on the shoulders. You don't see these people going way 100 meters into the forest to get trash that have been thrown way down the road. They just try to make the roads look clean. So over time, these bottles accumulate and pile up for decades and they're continuously functioning as traps this whole time, unless the bottle gets broken. Like if it gets filled with rainwater and freezes and cracks or, or breaks or gets buried by soil. Otherwise, it's just there for decades as a potential trap. Some of the bottles that we've found, we, know, we don't know when the animal was captured, but we know the bottle has been there functioning as a trap since the 80s, just based on the design of the bottle. Um, or the logo that's on the bottle. Like we found some that had like Back to the Future 1985. So the trap has been there since 1985. Um, some bottles that they don't even make anymore, like these glass milk bottles or glass Clorox bottles. So they've been there a long, long time capturing these animals for decades. This is a poster from England that I found um, where they're trying to make the public more aware of this problem. Um, here in America, we know littering is bad. There's that old uh, advertisement from the 70s where the Native American Indian cries when somebody throws trash out the window. But that's more about it being unsightly. But here they're trying to really emphasize that it's not just ugly, it's, it's a hazard for wildlife as well. 
Okay, so that's kind of the study that I did, but you may be wondering, well, this is very interesting, but how can I apply this information, especially if I'm not a, like a hardcore scientist? Well, I have adapted this study to be used with school children. My wife is a science teacher at Summit Charter School in Cashier, North Carolina, in, in Jackson County. And several years ago, they had an Earth Day litter pickup. And during this thing, um, I said, well, why don't I tag along? And if we find any bottles, then we'll look inside and see what we find. So we had the children in these safety vests and they gathered up the bottles. If it appeared like there was something in the bottle, we didn't want them to accidentally spill the contents. So we had them put them in individual Ziploc gallon bags. And so it was all sealed up. So that way if they did leak, at least it would be in the bag. And then we took it back to the school. And then in the classroom, of course, we had a discussion about what all this phenomenon is about. Um, my wife had them sort the trash into what could have been recycled, how much of it was glass versus plastic versus paper and non-recyclable materials. Um, I showed them a little bit about how to use the GPS so that we had these data points and then they could map the distributions of these species. Um, we took all sorts of measurements and calculations, calculate the percent of trash, percent of bottles that had something in it. And then, just like I was saying, we used those bones to examine and identify skulls and, and snails to, to a smaller extent. And so it kind of serves as an alternative to owl pellet dissection, um, with the caveat that these are not sanitary. When you get an owl pellet, um, it's been sterilized, baked. So these are, are not. So uh, usually I do as a demonstration. I don't have the kids do it themselves. Um, so I pick it out and wash the bones and then we try to recreate the skeletons, reconstruct the skeletons, identify the species, um, but it teaches them a little bit about anatomy of these different animals and how to identify these different groups of animals, in addition to just talking about um, the impacts of littering on wildlife. Oh, okay, I'm farther along than I thought. So this is our website. If you wanna learn a little bit more about the biological station where I work, um, and some of the classes that we have here, we have a nature center, which is on the botanical garden, which is open to the public. So it's not just the college campus part, um, but on this website, you can find more information about the studies that I've done. So I have PDFs of different publications. So there's two that are more scientific. There's one about um, using um, the data to map species distributions. And then another one about the impact of littering on mortality rates. But the third one here is the educational use of these, as I mentioned with my wife's class. So at this time, I'll uh, open it up to any questions. I'll go back to my uh, website page there. Patrick, thank you very much. You're welcome. Everybody, wherever you're at, great big round of applause. If you're watching from your office or your home, let everybody know how much you enjoyed this presentation by clapping for him right now. Maybe maybe you'll hear it all the way out uh, in Western North Carolina. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, very interesting stuff. I would not have known at all that litter like this would be serving as such a specific form of trap for these small animals. Like it, it just, just I can't say it across my mind. Right. And like I don't I said, toss bottles out the car, but. <laughs> it's, it's more abundant in the mountains, but it, it it's still found statewide. You just don't find as many species or, or find them as frequently as we do in the mountains. But um, there's been other studies that have looked at it in the eastern part of Virginia, at least uh, in Piedmont and coastal part of Virginia. So it'd be applicable in North Carolina as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, viewers, let me remind you, go ahead, drop your thoughts, questions, experiences in the chat on YouTube or into the comments on Facebook. Uh, and we'll start getting to your questions in just a moment. There actually was, in reference to the, your comment just now, Patrick, uh, Jeff Hall actually wrote in the chat that he found a bottle this year with about six skulls in it in longleaf habitat in the coastal plain, had never seen that before and didn't even know of the phenomena before today. Good. I mean, not good that you found it, but I'm glad to know that you're, uh, what I've talked about is useful. So yeah, that's actually... Um, becoming more and more well known now, not, not to toot my own horn, but there's people have done this prior to me, but very 
like people have known about it, but there wasn't a lot published about it. But then once I published my stuff, then it started kind of snowballing from there. And so lots of people have been doing this in, all, in other states as well. I think there's some in Kentucky and West Virginia and some other places. We asked very, very interesting. Now at the station, actually, who's doing surveys along the Blue Ridge Parkway, and she's doing multiple survey techniques, but she's using this also. And this is good because you don't have to set additional traps. It'll kill more animals. This is just already out there. And you don't have to check them every day like you do a pitfall trap or a, or a Sherman trap. You can just, if it's a nice day and you want to go outside, just go out there and it's kind of like going on an Easter egg hunt for bones. <laughs> to pull up some, some slimy skeletons. Um, this is, have you ever gotten lucky and found uh, a recently trapped animal and been able to set it free? No, but recently trapped, yes, but not ask. alive, no. Um, but we have gotten some that obviously been trapped the night before because they haven't started to smell or anything. But that one, oh, wow. identification much easier because you had the entire animal. Oh, right, yeah, sure. Um, so in the, what the, the first paper you published on this was 2010, I think I saw. Um, so, so you've been working on this for remember. like, for like well over a decade. Uh, I don't know. Are you are you starting to see changes? Like, uh, like I could imagine that something like climate change might shift the distributions of shrews, and and how you might experience that through this type of survey method. I haven't noticed any changes. Um, I don't do this as regularly as I did back then, um, but. Every year or so, um, I have groups from colleges come up. Uh, Clemson, for example, brings their mammalogy class up every other year. And this is something we do as a part of this workshop that I do. Um, so I don't, I, I don't check them as regularly, but we tend to find the same things in the same places. Very interesting. Uh, let's see here. Jeff wants to know if you've encountered any of the rarer shrews in bottles. Um, not rock shrews or, or water shrews. Um, pygmy shrews are considered rare-ish, um, but I haven't got very many of those, only like a dozen or so of those, if, if that many. I can't quite remember the number, but compared to like, Lorraine is like, you know, hundreds, um, but only a, a handful of the other ones. All and right, and then- Not so much that they aren't being captured, it's probably more that they uh, disintegrate faster or get scavenged more fat. So it's, it's hard to know whether the capture rate is actually less for that, or it's just the the ability to find them is less. Okay, makes sense. Uh, let's see, the next one here, they write, Patrick, it seems as if the public is more aware of other small animals like moles, etc., but shrews seem to be a mystery or unknown. Why do you think this is when they're so cool? Probably mainly because of their size and um, they're very secretive in nature. And in the rest of the state too, there's just not that many kinds compared to the mountains. But even here in the mountains, they're, you just don't, the, the big ones you do, like I said, cats kill them a lot, but people just automatically assume they're a mouse. But the other ones, you have to kind of be in the forest to encounter them unless you just happen to see one. Um, and that's just what I do. So, but my, my dog though, surprisingly, um, killed one in my yard and it turned out to be, you asked about rare species, it turned out to be a cryptotus, a least shrew, which is very rare um, up here at this elevation. Um, and it's the only the second one ever found from Macon County. So good job to my dog for finding this animal. So now we have another record of that species. How does uh, like this research project that you've been doing how does it fit into the, the broader work of Highlands Biological Station? The Highlands Biological Station is a center for uh, research on, on the biodiversity of the Southern Appalachian Mountains. Um, that's the majority of the work, although we do some other things too. The majority of the work is on um, like community ecology and, and biogeographical distributions and that sort of thing. So this is just another um, alternate method for surveying these animals that do doesn't take as much effort. Yeah, right. And I guess I'm just, I feel like, obviously I'm wrong already, I should say that, but that uh, I would hope that littering had fallen out of fashion, but it doesn't seem to have. 
No, although I, we don't tend to see lots more accumulation, very slow accumulations. So hopefully it's, it's still happening, but not as often. Although that's really only bottles. There's, there's lots of other things that people tend to throw, like televisions and, and sofas and <laughs> things they don't want to have to take to the landfill and pay for. But maybe just throwing things out of your car window as you drive has, has gone down a little bit. And I mean, it, you work in environmental education. It's what we do a lot of here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. A lot of the people who are watching this program do environmental education programs or in classrooms. You know, like we're talking about nature and the environment a lot around here. Um, I would guess that putting a sign on a road uh, in the mountains isn't enough to convince people to to stop throwing their stuff into the ravines. No, in fact, ironically, one of the sites that I find the most stuff at when I go out with this group every so year, uh, so many years, has a sign on it. It says, keep North Carolina clean and green. And that's where I find, because it's the nice ravine that people want to throw their stuff down in. So yeah, sadly, okay. people don't seem to care. They just have to come watch this talk. They'll come to our YouTube and channel and find it. I will put the, the warning out. If you want to do this study, though, um, watch out for there's lots of broken glass and, you know, the steep slopes. You, you need to have like heavy boots on and, and work gloves and that sort of thing. Beware what you find in bottles, because sometimes you think it's a dead animal, which is gross enough. But other times it's like, you know, people's chewing tobacco and, and things like that, too. So it's, it's nasty work, but you, you do, it does yield lots of information. You know, uh, just as I was bringing up signage, uh, Cindy wrote, do you think signage, perhaps in collaboration with DOT, showing that bottles can be death traps for small mammals would make a difference or reduce the amount of bottles discarded? It, it certainly wouldn't hurt. As I showed you, that there's that sign yeah. in England, and I don't know the effectiveness of that sign, but they are at least trying to make the public aware of it. And there's also places that have introduced bottle bills, which is like, I'm not that familiar with it, but it's something to do with it has to have the cap on it or, or I can't quite, but anyway, if they're, if you're going to litter, at least put the cap on and that way it'll be on the size of the roads, but it can't trap an animal. That's, um, that, that's an interesting compromise to make <laughs> in, in, in trying to protect some of these animals because the numbers really were astonishing. Yeah. He were like, like 40 shrews or 40 small mammals a year, I think it was. Yeah, and, and, and then, that's, that's based on these overlooks or, or pullout sites, which where it's a little more co heavily concentrated. Um, but nevertheless, that's that's a lot. Well, and, and then there are a lot of these pull-offs and overlooks all over the mountains and on lots of different roads, busy roads, some of the smaller back roads. Uh, and then I think about like during the pandemic, how many more millions of people got outdoors and were visiting like the Blue Ridge Parkway when it reopened. Right. And, and what the impact of that could be. It'll be very interesting. As I mentioned, there's a student here right now who's serving overlooks and things on the Blue Ridge Parkway. So it'll be very interesting to see um, what she finds and compares that to what I've done on uh, just these local roads, not on, not on the parkway and in the National, uh, National Park. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. All right. And so tell me if if folks wanted to to keep up with the work that's happening at Highlands Biological Station uh, or if maybe somebody out in the mountains wants you to come and uh, give them a presentation on not throwing their bottles into the ravines. How can they do Please. that? Um, go to highlandsbiological.org and it's under contact outreach. You'll find all my information. This is my publication, but it has all my information, my phone number, email. And that, that sort of thing. And I'd be happy um, to give a talk to your organization, either in person or uh, virtually. In fact, I'm doing one again in the uh, fall for, well, I can't remember, <laughs> but, it, but it's another uh, park outside of Raleigh, I believe. Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Well, everybody can, uh, they can check the website and maybe be able to keep up. Um, but another question for you here from the chat before we wrap it up. 
Do you know if this is making a significant impact on populations of some of these shrews? That I don't know. Um, shrew populations are pretty high to begin with. And so I doubt it's really reducing their overall populations um, I mean, regionally, but it might like at that site. Um, and if there are rare species such as the least shrew or the um, water shrew or something, we certainly don't want to um, you know, reduce their population further because a single capture of those animals is a significant um, percentage of, that, of those animals' populations. Absolutely. And, you know, would this be something good for like an ecology or biology student to, to take on and to, to continue to research? Do we need to get like PhD graduate students out there looking for bottles? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Roadsides in the mountain? Like I said, this is not limited to the mountain region, although it's just more prevalent here. Um, but yeah, you need across the state, um, we'd fill in those gaps. Um, some people have taken up the mandolin, and like I said, they've done it. And I can't remember exactly where, but I think it was West Virginia and Kentucky. Um, there's a person in Italy who's been doing this. Um, so, so yeah, it, it has kind of caught on and people are starting to look at it um, in a broader geographic area. Or even to, uh, to like um, add it as a survey method, maybe to uh, something else that you're already studying. Like if you're already running transects, uh, uh, at a site and looking at biodiversity and pick up exactly. the bottles and check those out too. Right. Like don't add bottles. <laughs> a lot of people ask don't. me, but if you put the bottles out there, like, no, I didn't put the bottles. These are ones that are already you know, in situ. Um, but yeah, it's there and it has data just waiting to be discovered. So it's just a matter of, you know, your willingness to get dirty and, and handle this nasty, gross, slimy garbage. Um, but there's lots of data. In fact, hang, hang on one second. I'll show you. Ooh, okay. I feel like we're about to get like behind the scenes tour into the Highlands Museum collection. Right. So this is one I use when I talk about this to school groups and stuff. So yeah, I'll just kind of hold it up rather than emptying it. But this is kind of what it looks like straight out of the bottle when it's dry. So it's just kind of like an owl pellet. I don't know if you can really see the bones in there or not. But then once it's cleaned up, so here's just all from one site location, all these skulls and things. Oh, wow. But that's, that's amazing. That's all from one site, not one bottle, but one site, one visit mm -hmm. to one site. So yeah, they're, they're very abundant out there, but this is something that's pretty straightforward. I mean, maybe the identification of species, it takes a little more um, expertise, but just doing this, like even like young people, children can do this as long as they, Take the precautions, you know, safety precautions, because you are on the side of the highway, and there's traffic sometimes going by. Um, there's like, and I mentioned there's steep slopes, broken glass, other trash, rusty things you have to worry about. Um, there's always the potential for yellow jackets you could run into in the woods, um, but the the technique is very straightforward and simple. Just dump out what's in there, pick through the bones, and, and there you go, like kind of like an owl pellet dissection. It, now I'm curious, like we're a natural history museum. We collect all of these things, uh, you know, with information where they were from and, and that becomes available to scientists. Um, do you do similar things? Like, do you have all of the small mammals that you've collected stored away with little tags yeah, of information? This, too? This, this whole, well, not that like precisely, but I have them all in bags. Mm -hmm. The one of several bins that I have um, just filled with these little bags of bones. I can't, I have so many that I couldn't have them all in individual little canisters, but I have them sorted by sight that way. Unless it's a rare species, a unique, and like that mold I found, I have that separated out, but otherwise it's just here and it's sorted by date and, and site. That's, that's great. Love a good museum collection, wherever <laughs> it happens to be. All right. Well, everybody in the chat is uh, expressing their appreciation to you for today's presentation. You're so, welcome. Thank you very much. I appreciate any opportunity to, to speak to adult audiences instead of just children all the time. <laughs> Excellent. Well, this was great. We'll have to have you back again uh, sometime soon. Anytime. Thank you. Everybody, thanks for tuning in to this edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. We will, of course, be back here again next week with another great program. So go ahead, 
subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel, click the bell to get notified. That way you'll know when we're live with another great guest speaker, bringing us more exciting and interesting information. Uh, you can also follow the Museum of Natural Sciences on social media. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can keep up with what's happening at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. Their website is eenorthcarolina.org. And you can follow them on Twitter at North Carolina. Covered and you'll know all the great things that are happening all across the state of North Carolina. Until next time, everybody, uh, take care, stay safe. If you get out there looking for shrews, be extra safe. And we'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you.